I think I'm getting feedback on this. Would you turn it down just a wee bit? Thank you. Let's take our Bibles and turn to the book of Genesis. Today we are looking at Genesis in a nutshell. I'm not sure we'll make it through all 50 chapters, even if we are roaring along in nutshell fashion. But um, over to Genesis chapter 1, where we were just a few moments ago, we want to try to summarize the working of God through history as God begins with creation, and as we saw last week, we see Genesis ending in a coffin in Egypt. What a, an incredible contrast between the way Genesis begins and the way Genesis ends. I know that for sure we're going to have to wait until next week to compare Genesis with Revelation. We see the beginning of all things in Genesis. We find the ending and the tying up of all the loose ends that we saw started in Genesis over in the book of Revelation. We'll have to let, let that be for next week. But um, today we want to see if we can summarize each of these chapters and see why they are important in the sequence in which God gives them to us. You know, God never does things haphazardly. God never does things in a disorganized manner. God is a God of order. God is not a God of confusion. The Apostle Paul makes that clear for us in the theological statements of the New Testament that he writes. But in the book of Genesis, we find things moving from perfect order to what appears to be the ultimate of chaos, death and the disorganization of all the breakdown of the body and the turning back as God had cursed Adam from dust you are made and to dust you shall return. And that's how we find Genesis ending. Beginning with successful creation, ending in man's abysmal failure. But we saw that in those final few verses of Genesis, we have the ray of hope that brings us all the rest of the way through the Bible. There is one faithful man. There is one man of faith that is left at the end of the book of Genesis, though he is the one dying he takes an oath of his brothers that when God visits them with the promises that he has given, that they will take his bones and take them out of Egypt and bring them back to the land of promise. And so though Genesis from the surface appears to end in dismal failure, in utter ruin and chaos as compared to chapter 1, there is a seed that is yet alive. It is the seed of faith. That is the theme of the scripture for man. That if man would live, he must live by faith. The just shall live by faith. And this is what we spoke on last week as we looked on Reformation Sunday. What does it mean? The just shall live by faith. We find that is the seed kernel that is given to us here at the end of the book of Genesis, the remember of the covenant promise that God made to Abraham. A verse quoted in the New Testament in Hebrews 10.37, that wonderful word of promise, the just shall live by faith. We often get tired of waiting for God's promises. Well, we saw many passages last two weeks ago as we looked at that, but we're told to wait patiently. I know that there are some of you here who have waited a long time for God to do something that you wanted Him to do and it didn't happen, and it didn't happen, and it didn't happen, but you knew that the promise of God was true. And so you continued to wait patiently until God answered those prayers of yours. 
We all of us are waiting for the return of Christ. We look at the passages that dealt with that last two weeks ago. And we wait by faith. But today now we want to move back to Genesis in a nutshell. Genesis chapter 1. God gives to us in each of these chapters, these opening ten chapters of the book of Genesis, some incredible history of the world. Those first ten chapters bring us all the way down to the division of the nations, the call of Abraham. Genesis chapter 1. We find here the six days of creation. Interesting, we don't move into day 7 until we get to Genesis 2. But the six days of creation. We find also in this chapter what we call the dominion mandate or the multiplication mandate. Where God gives to man authority over all of the creation which God has made. We call it also the multiplication mandate because it is something that God gives to us at the very beginning with the creation. And it is something that God reinstates after the flood of Noah. Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. Many Christians have forgotten that God has never rescinded that mandate. Oh, what a different world this would be if every Bible-believing Christian had as many children as God would have permitted them to have. And that those children would be trained in the fear of the Lord, raised in the wisdom of God, knowledgeable in the scriptures, faithful in their practice of the Christian life. What an impact that would have made on our world and what a difference it would have been. But as we see man falling in other ways throughout the book of Genesis, we find him faltering in that as well. Genesis 1. We find first day, light, the division of darkness from the light, and the darkness called night and the light called day. Day 2, the firmament, the spreading out of the heavens above the earth. That's where the sky waters are divided from the earth waters and the spreading out of the heavens. Day number three, dry land separated from the seas. You see, there's a separation going on all the way through the book of Genesis. God is setting the stage for us here at creation to remind us that his people are going to be called a separated people. You've got it on the wall behind you here. That is something that never falters throughout scripture. The doctrine of separation. God started it here by separating light from darkness, separating the water in the sky from the water on the earth, separating the dry land from the seas, separating interplanetary space from the earth. On day four, we find the creation of the sun, the moon, the stars, and they're given for signs, for seasons, for days, and for years, and to give light to the night. Oh, what a fascinating study that was when we looked at those four words, the signs, the seasons, the days, and the years. God gave them to tell us a message about himself. On day number five, we find the creation of the water creatures and the flying creatures. God fills the oceans with all the incredible creatures that are there. New ones being discovered every year that people did not know existed before. Rather interesting, not too long ago, several weeks ago, um, we got a newsletter. In fact, we got first in email form and then we got it in newsletter form about some little creatures that have been found around some freshwater springs at the bottom of the Dead Sea where nobody thought that anything could live before. They were totally unknown before this. Oh, the magnificent ways of God. The things that he has created. The things that we don't know about, that we don't understand in the remote jungles of South America, the jungles of Africa, inland China, all the different places where, where really, quote, modern science hasn't gone yet to see what God has done. What an infinite variety of creatures he has made. Day six, the creation of the land creatures and the creation of man. Genesis chapter 1 gives us an overview. Gives us an insight into what God did in this brief span of time. Six literal days. 
We move to Genesis chapter 2 and creation is finished. God rests on the seventh day. But then Genesis chapter 2 gives us a restatement of the details of the creation of man. He told us he had created him there in chapter 1. Now he's going to tell us what the earth was like and how he created him as we get into chapter 2. He gives us the condition of the earth. He tells us that there was no rain yet and that's going to be significant because things are going to change when we get to chapter 6. The ground is watered by a mist that comes up out of the ground. We find the creation of Adam as distinct from the animals. He wasn't just part of that plethora of animals that God created. No, he is given distinct creation by God in the image of God. Not said of any other animals. He doesn't come from apes. He doesn't come from chimpanzees or baboons or orangutans or gorillas. He doesn't come from the monkeys who have tails. He is distinctly created from the dust of the ground. God doesn't take an animal and form him into a man. He creates him from the dust of the ground. We find in Genesis chapter 2 the forming of the Garden of Eden so that man will have a specific responsibility, if you will, a job to do for God. And then we find a gorgeous description of the garden and the rivers that go out of it and all the gold that can be found there. It was a magnificent place. We find God speaking to Adam and giving him the prohibition about the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The first command that God gives to Adam is a prohibition. Adam, who has not yet fallen... Adam who has no sin nature as of yet. Adam who is in a state of innocence. And then God tells him to name the animals, which he does. And God is using it as an illustration for him that there is no creature suited for him. Man is not an animal. And when Adam realizes there is no helpmate fit for him, God places him into a deep sleep and takes from his side a rib and takes that and creates Eve from Adam's side. And then he presents her to him, Eve, probably the most beautiful woman that ever lived, Chava, the mother of all living. You and I go back to Eve and Adam. Oh, what a wonderful history it would be if, if nothing in Genesis chapter 3 happened. But it is from there that we move to Genesis 3 and Satan enters the garden. Genesis 3, he deceives Eve to eat the forbidden fruit. And then Eve entices Adam. We know that Adam was not deceived because the Apostle Paul says so. He walked into it with his eyes wide open. The woman was deceived, but the man was not deceived. He knew what the consequences would be. He was enticed to eat the fruit, and he ate it. And suddenly, the glory departs from them. They realize that they are naked. In their shame, they sew fig leaves together to try to hide their nakedness. And then... At the end of the day, God comes walking in the cool of the garden. Oh, what pain there must have been in the heart of God. He knew where they were. He knew what they had done. But he's a God who calls us into account. Adam, Adam, Ayecha, Adam, Adam, where art thou? God knew. Dear friends, when you and I sin, be assured that God will call us into account. God asks him, what have you done? Not because he doesn't know, but because God requires confession. Not to another man. God requires confession to him. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us 
from all unrighteousness. And so they are called into account. They confess their sin. But here man has brought the entire human race under the curse. We find the curse is placed on the serpent. We find a curse is placed on Adam and Eve. The serpent to crawl on his belly. The man to labor and work and only get thorns and thistles. The woman to have pain in childbearing. And the greatest curse of all, death. Dying you shall die. In the day that thou eatest the fruit thereof, you will surely die. And so death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. It was by one man centered into the human race, and death by sin. And this is the point at which it enters. But it is immediately following that that God gives hope. God gives us what's been called theologically the Proto-Evangelium. The, the first sign of the Gospel in Genesis chapter 3 verse 15. That the seed of the woman will crush the head of the serpent. And that is the promise of the coming Messiah. You see, where there is sin, there is grace. And grace is greater than our sin. Oh, the grace of God, even back in the garden, though God must judge sin, God gives hope that he will solve the problem of sin. And so he did in his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the chapter closes with Adam and Eve being driven from the garden. And God placing the Shekinah glory, the flaming torch, which turned every which way, to guard the entrance to the garden, that man would not have access to the tree of life in his sinful state. Oh, can you imagine had Adam and Eve eaten of that tree? and lived forever, ever growing older and older and older and more corrupt and more evil and more sinful and death being impossible. That too is the grace of God. We move into chapter 4. Cain and Abel are born, a farmer and a shepherd. Cain works hard, he tills the ground, he gets good fruit. In spite of the fact that there's the curse, God graciously enables him to raise fruit that's beautiful fruit. Abel deals with the sheep, the goats, and the cattle. He's a shepherd. And one day God calls on them to offer sacrifices, and Cain brings his best, and Abel brings the lamb of the flock. And God has respect unto Abel, and to Cain he has no respect. And Cain is angry, and God says, Why are you angry, Cain? Don't you realize that sin is crouching at your door? And the word sin there is a sin offering is crouching at your door. God had brought the lamb to Cain, but Cain would not. So instead we have the very first murder. Cain kills Abel. We find the flight of Cain into the land of Nod. We find Cain's descendants are listed for us in Genesis chapter 4. We not only find Cain himself has committed murder, but one of his descendants, Lamech, commits murder also, and then takes the wife of the slain man, and he now is the first polygamist in Genesis chapter 4. We find the first music and the first musical instruments in Genesis chapter 5, excuse me, we're in Genesis 5 now. We find the first metalworking in Genesis chapter 5. We get to chapter 6. And God graciously gives Adam and Eve another son, whom they name Seth. And it says, Then began men to call upon the name of the Lord. Oh, when Abel was murdered, and when all there was was Cain and his descendants, and Adam and Eve, there was no one calling on the name of the Lord. But when Seth is born, the one who replaces Abel in this line of promise, it says, men then began to call on the name of the Lord. 
We get down to chapter 5. We find the descendants of Adam through Seth. We find Enoch walking with God. We find Methuselah also in the line of Seth living 969 years. That brings us up to the very year of the flood of Noah. We find Noah is born. He lives 500 years and begets Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And so we end Genesis 5. But men are going back to their wickedness. They had called on the name of the Lord after the birth of Seth. But now we find Genesis chapter 6. Satan doesn't like the fact that men are calling on the name of the Lord. And so the line of Seth is intermarrying here with the line of Cain. And we find the earth is filled with violence and the earth is filled with wickedness. We find the giants in the earth in those days. We find God determines to send the flood. God commands Noah to build an ark and he gives the details for the ark. And then we find Noah obeys and builds the ark. Genesis 7. The cup of God's wrath is full. God tells Noah to board the ark with two of every creature. Then God tells Noah to bring on board seven of every clean animal which will be used for sacrifice. Noah obeys, enters the ark, and it tells us that God shut the door. Friends, there is coming a day when God is going to shut the door. No more will be able to go into the ark of safety. No more will be able to go into the ark of salvation. No more will be brought in. Noah preached righteousness for 120 years, and the people scorned him and laughed and mocked and jeered. Someday there is coming a day when God will shut the door. And if you have not trusted Christ, you will be left out. God shut the door. It wasn't Noah who shut the door. God shut the door. And when God shuts a door, it cannot be opened. When God opens a door, it cannot be closed. Book of Revelation, you'll see more of that next week, the Lord willing. And then we find the 40 days and 40 nights of rain. And most people only think of 40 days and 40 nights of rain, but that's not all it says. It says, and the fountains of the great deep were broken up. The crust of the earth ripped apart in several places. And those of you who know something about plate tectonics and the movements of the crust of the earth, that underneath the earth's surface there was a huge reservoir of water which spurted up in gigantic geysers. And we find that Genesis chapter 8 tells us how long that took place. We find the water continues to rise on the earth for 150 days. That's because of the fountains of the great deep breaking up, because it only rained 40 days and 40 nights. But the water continued to rise on the earth for 150 days, and every air-breathing creature outside the ark, and all the people who were outside the ark, they all drowned. Genesis 8, God stops the rain and the fountains of the deep. But then it takes time for the flood to go down. It tells us there in that chapter that the flood subsides for another 150 days. Folks, you realize, when we're talking the flood of Noah, we're not talking 40 days. We are talking over a year when we talk about the flood of Noah. This was a global, not a local, catastrophe. This was a worldwide flood that covered the tops of mountains. That's why you find seashells on the top of Mount Everest. Not carried there by some, you know, picnicker. They're up there because they were put there in the flood. We find the ark rests on Mount Ararat in the seventh month of the seventeenth day. Waters continue to subside until the mountaintops are seen. After forty days, Noah releases a raven and a dove, and the dove does uh, the dove does not return. Seven days later, excuse me, the, the, the um, raven does not return. Seven days later, Noah releases the dove again, and she does not return the second time around. In the second month, the twenty-seventh day, the earth is dry. God tells Noah to leave the ark with his family and with the animals. Noah obeys, builds an altar, and sacrifices from the, from the clean animals that he has brought on board. Genesis chapter 9. Oh, how quickly men fall back into sin. Noah, a man who has seen the judgment of God, a man who has found favor in the eyes of God, the only righteous man before the flood, and God saves him and his family. Genesis chapter 9 seems to start off well. God blesses Noah and his sons, reinstates the multiplication or the dominion command. God places fear of man in the hearts of the animals. God gives Noah the right for the first time to eat animals. 
and a blood prohibition is established. You recall back there in the chapter we read in Genesis, man could eat herbal things, but he could not eat animals. We find for the first time in Genesis 9, God gives men the right to eat animals. In Genesis chapter 9, God establishes capital punishment for murder. God establishes the Noahic covenant. He promises that there will never be another worldwide flood, and he gives a sign of his covenant, which is the rainbow. Now, folks, you will find out there, among people who call themselves Christians, people who say that it wasn't a global flood. They say, well, it was only a local flood. It flooded the valley of uh, Mesopotamia, you know, between the Tigris and Euphrates River. Or it flooded some other local area. Or that it was a tranquil flood. Or that it was a slowly encroaching flood so they could get out of the area. If the flood of Noah was only a local flood, God lied when he gave the rainbow. Because there have been many floods of local nature, some of them quite large and quite catastrophic, but since the times of Noah. And yet we see the rainbow in the sky. That's a promise that God will never send a worldwide flood again. If the flood of Noah is only a local flood, God lied because he sent many local floods since then. Then we find the sad end of Genesis chapter 9. Noah plants a vineyard. Things that seem to start off so innocently. I think probably most of you like to eat grapes. I like to eat grapes. I don't like to eat grapes that have been smushed and sat around for a while. But uh, I like to eat fresh grapes. But Noah smushed them, made them into wine, drank the wine, and got drunk. And as he's lying in his tent uncovered, his son Ham walks in, sees him, thinks it's funny, goes and tells his brothers they're shocked. They take a cloak and walk backwards and cover their father so that his nakedness is not seen. When Noah awakes from his stupor, he curses Canaan. You say, now why? What did Canaan have to do with this? Canaan was the son of Ham. The curse didn't fall on Ham. It's not Ham who gets cursed. It's Ham's son, Canaan, who is cursed who is the ancestor of the Canaanites. And Noah blesses Shem and Japheth. Genesis chapter 10, we find the descendants of Noah by his three sons. Genesis 10 is what's been known as the table of the nations. Every national group in the world traces itself back to Genesis chapter 10, the table of the nations. First, we have the sons of Japheth are listed for us in Genesis 10. He's the ancestor of those various tribes that scattered out across Europe and Turkey and Russia and various islands which are mentioned there. Then we find the descendants of Ham and various wicked nations are listed under the descendants of Ham. And there in Genesis chapter 10 we find mentioned Nimrod. Now those of you who have been with us on Wednesday evening, we've been doing a study in Bible prophecy. And we just finished the section dealing with the appearance of Babylon in the book of Genesis and the final destruction of Babylon in the book of Revelation. And we find Babylon in Genesis is both a political economic system and a religious system. When we get to Revelation, Revelation chapter 17, we find the religious system Babylon is described, which has come down to us in the religious worship of Rome. And we find economic, political Babylon described in chapter 18, which will be the site of Babylon itself, ancient Babylon, a center of economic control. And indeed, what is controlled is the oil of the world. Fascinating, what starts in Genesis is finished off in Revelation. More about that, the Lord willing, next week. But Nimrod, Nimrod is born. Nimrod, a mighty hunter before God, a man who is described as a rebel against God. And God has said, I want you to spread out over the face of the earth. And Nimrod says, no, I think I'll build a city right here. And he builds Babylon. And we find listed under him, his descendants include Assyria and Nineveh. They trace back to Babylon. And then we find the descendants of Canaan, the son of Ham, includes Sidon. You've heard of Tyre and Sidon. Heth, that's the Hittites, the grotesque, uh, immoral empire that used to live in central Turkey, and I've told you about them before. The Jebusites, those were the ones who were in control of the city 
which David took, which now becomes Jerusalem in his days. We find him and his descendants listed among his descendants listed the Amorites. We find the origin of Sodom and Gomorrah through the descendants of Ham and Canaan. A rather evil list when you study it. And then the end of Genesis chapter 10 gives us the descendants of Shem, which are various Middle Eastern tribes. Most of them are not familiar to us today, but if you were with us back when we first started Genesis, we went over those tribes. And the note is made that he is the father of all the children of Eber. That's the word from which we get our word Hebrew. We move into Genesis chapter 11. Genesis 11 is the Tower of Babel, which brings us back again to Babylon and to the rebellion of Nimrod. We find here the beginning of astrology. We find here Ishtar and Tammuz, the mother-child goddess pair is established, which comes over in the Mary Jesus pictures that you have of Rome. We find the scattering of the nations and the languages when God comes down and sees their rebellion. We find the descendants then of Shem taking us all the way to Terah. And then we find the descendants of Terah to Abraham, Nahor, and Haran. Here for the first time we find Abram and Sarah introduced and we're told that Sarah is barren. Then we find Terah, Abraham's father, dies as does Abraham's brother Haran, who is the father of Lot, setting the stage for all that is to follow with Lot and the Sodom and Gomorrah issues and things that are to come. Because when God calls Abraham to leave the land in Genesis 12, Abraham takes Lot, his brother's son, with him. God gives Abraham the Abrahamic covenant. This is the beginning of the tremendous promises that God has made to Abraham, which he is fulfilling both through the Jewish people and ultimately through the Messiah, the Lord Jesus Christ. He gives him the Abrahamic covenant that he will have a land, that God will identify that land for him. Every place your foot walks will belong to you. He will make him a great nation. He will make him a great name. He will make him a blessing. He will bless those that bless him and curse those that curse him. He will bless all the families of the earth through Abraham. God calls him to leave. Abraham obeys. God appears again, reiterates the covenant. But Abraham, instead of merely going south, continues to go south until he gets all the way down to Egypt. How often the devil would like to take us the way we want to go, but farther than we want to go. That was an old wrestling motto that we had up on the sides of our gymnasium, many, many mottos around the gym to encourage the boys in their wrestling. Uh, one of the mottos was, take your man the way he wants to go faster than he wants to go. And that way, when you were getting into a roll, you just continued it until you were still back on top again. Satan did that with Abraham. Abraham heads south. But he doesn't have any breaks. He keeps on going until he gets down to Egypt because there's a famine in the land. Could God have provided for Abraham when there was a famine in the land? The answer is yes. God told him to go. God makes provision when you go where God wants you to go. He always does. It's only when we're out of fellowship with him that we begin to experience the lack that comes from disobedience. He goes to Egypt, and there he begins to walk by fear instead of by faith. He sees the Egyptians, he looks at his wife Sarah, and she is a sharp-looking woman. And he begins to realize these people have no fear of God before their eyes. If they see Sarah, they'll kill me and they'll take her. And so, fearful for his own life, he gets his wife involved in the sin of lying. He says, look, when they ask you who you are and who I am, just tell them, I'm your brother, and then they'll treat me well for your sake. Talk about selfish. This is not how husbands and wives are supposed to work, by the way. Abraham is out of fellowship. And so, of course, Pharaoh takes Sarah into his house, and God immediately plagues Pharaoh's house, and then gives him a vision in the night and says, if you don't let that woman go because she's the wife of another man, I'm going to kill you and everybody in your house. Pharaoh says, hey, I was innocent. I didn't know that. After all, she said that, that she was his sister. He says, give her back to him. It's his wife. And so Pharaoh reproves Abraham and gives a protective order 
concerning Sarah. We move to Genesis chapter 13. Abraham now moves back to the land. He moves into what's called nowadays the Negev, the Southlands, the area where Beersheba is located, the southern part of Israel. And it tells us that he's very rich. It tells us all about his, all of his riches, his animals, all the flocks that he has. And Lot is very rich too. And he and Lot, their, their herdsmen start to get into dispute. The land isn't big enough for all of them. So Abraham says to young Lot, this nephew of his, Tell you what, you decide which part of the land you want and you go there and I will go the other direction. You know, now there's a man who can trust the promises of God and not worry about the outcomes when it seems like things are being taken away from him. God had promised that land to Abraham. He had not promised it to Lot. He had promised it to Abraham. Lot is only a nephew. But Abraham lets Lot take his choice so that there will be no strife and contention. Lot, of course, being greedy and selfish, chooses the very best part of the land for himself. He chooses the well-watered Valley of Jordan. And it tells us in the text that the Valley of Jordan was like the Garden of Eden. It was so beautiful and so green and so lush in those days. But it also had five cities in it. It had Sodom and Gomorrah, Edma, Zeboim, and Zoar. Those are known as the five cities of the plain. All of them but Zoar were destroyed when God rained down fire from heaven. Zoar, the city to which Lot ultimately fled with his two daughters. And Abraham goes the other way. And you know, as he does so, God, who is very gracious, appears to Abraham again. He reinstates his promises to Abraham, and Abraham moves to Hebron, Hebron, and builds an altar. I knew we weren't going to be able to make it all the way through in 45 minutes. Um, folks, it's 20 after. I'd wanted to go through the book of Genesis in a nutshell. I've given you several nutshells, so the Lord willing, we'll pick up there next week. Our gracious Heavenly Father, how we thank you for your word and for its power. We thank you for the grace of God that reached down to sinful man all the way back into the Garden of Eden. When man first sinned, you reached down, showed mercy by giving him the promise that someday the seed of the woman would crush the head of the serpent. A God who continued to work with man, though man got worse and worse and worse and worse and continued to rebel. And yet, rather than destroying all of mankind, He chose a man, Noah. He showed mercy unto Noah. Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And you told him to build an ark by which he saved his house and became an heir of the righteousness which is of faith and got listed in Hebrews chapter 11. But oh, how quickly man falls again. And yet in your grace, in your patience, in your kindness, you reach down again and give more promises. Noah falls into sin. He curses one grandson. He blesses two other sons. And then we find... Your blessing is extending, but suddenly it is interrupted by a man named Nimrod. A man who curses you, a man who decides he will not obey your command to multiply and fill the earth, but he's going to build a city. He's going to establish his own religion. He's going to do his own thing. He's a mighty hunter before the Lord. And so we find the beginnings of Babylon. It's wicked system. It's anti-God rebellion. And then we find you reaching down once again. I'm calling a man by the name of Abraham. Oh, in the midst of man's sin and wickedness, you show him grace. You call him out and promise him a land and promise him a great nation and promise your blessings upon him and promise that through him the Messiah will come. That seed of the woman promised in Genesis 3.15. And you tell him to go to a land that you will show him. But he goes too far. And so we find man once again in disobedience and rebellion. And yet you're a God of mercy. You reach down in the midst of that. And you plague Pharaoh's house. And you warn Pharaoh to let Sarah go so that she might be the pure wife of Abraham. 
and you bring him back into the land to which you had called him. And then we find Lot deciding he wants the best of the land and Abraham letting it go. But you still love Abraham and you still got that promise for him and you still tell him that you're going to give him that land. Father, what we get from the book of Genesis is that you are a God of grace. You're a God of mercy. You're a God who loves sinful men. Well, we thank you that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Oh, Father, there's so much more in this book. So much more of the proof that you, the God of heaven, love us, care for us, and are willing to sacrifice your best for us that we might live. Father, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.